Over the course of our previous World Series reviews on this channel, we've tended to look at World Series that may or may not have been lost to the public eye in terms of either the teams who played or the quality of the series itself. But today, we want to look at a series that is by no means terrible, but has the unfortunate situation of being stuck between two of the most iconic series of all time in the 2014 and 2016 series respectively. Pitting the returning AL and AL Central champion 95 and 67 KC Royals against a resurgent NL East winning 90 and 72 Mets, we saw an entertaining and electrifying series that is plagued by what ifs and is a triumph of the ultimate small market team. We present the 2015 World Series. Before we meet our teams, let's take a brief moment and acknowledge the 2015 season as a whole. A-Rod recorded his 3,000th hit and 2,000th RBI this year in his last full season of play. Seven no-hitters were thrown this season, one of the most no-hitterful seasons of all time, with Max Scherzer throwing two, including a 17-strikeout performance against the division rival Mets on the last day of the regular season. You know who the last person to do that was? Nolan Ryan in 1973. And speaking of Nolan Ryan, I want to tell you guys about the time that I actually met Nolan Ryan. So what's up everyone, official, unofficial, Blue Phoenix Films, face reveal here. But like I said, I want to tell you about the time I met Nolan Ryan. So I am a student of the University of Iowa. And you know who else goes to the University of Iowa? Caitlin Clark, the greatest women's college basketball player of all time. And you know who wants to come see Caitlin Clark? Uh, Nolan Ryan, apparently, as he said to the press that he wanted to come see Caitlin Clark play. So he came to see Caitlin Clark play. Uh, this was the game on March 3rd, 2024. Iowa is playing Ohio State. It is the final home game of the regular season. It is a packed, sold out house. I get a text from my father that there is Nolan Ryan, supposedly at the game, sitting all the way across the stadium from me. And I looked down at my phone and I look and I see what section that that could be. And I look across and there he is. I see him. And he is completely, he is completely camouflaged with the slew of older white Iowans that are there. He's got the hat. He's got like the checked farmer shirt. You know, he's not trying to stand out at all, except that he's sitting in like some of the most expensive seats in the house. Anyway, so after the game, I, I knew that I was not going to be able to get to him. It was, there was not enough time. I was too focused on the game anyway. And I was like, well, that's cool. I was in the same building as him, you know, whatever. And I am going to the bathroom after the game. And sure enough, Nolan Ryan shuffling to the bathroom too. And so I saw him, I was like, excuse me, sir, like, are you Nolan Ryan? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, so I was like, this is crazy. This man has seven no hitters and is arguably the greatest pitcher of all time. And if not, he's definitely on the pitching Mount Rushmore. And I was like, holy crap, like it's this dude. And he just looks like it's somebody's grandpa. And so really nice guy, I got to shake his hand, took a picture with him, picture right there. And yeah, he just, just going to the bathroom but at that point i thought it would be really awkward to then just like be like oh yeah i'm going to the bathroom too so that is the story of how i accidentally met nolan ryan going to the bathroom at an iowa women's basketball game in the year 2024. Steven Matz of the mets also had one of the most electrifying debuts ever for a pitcher going seven and two-thirds on five hits, six strikeouts, and two earned runs, including a controversial leadoff home run to Brandon Phillips. The electrifying part, though? He went three for three at the plate with a double, two singles, and four RBI in a 7-2 Mets win. Ah, shout-outs to the old National League. On April 29th, the Orioles and White Sox partook in 2020 day at the Camden Yards, where they played a game in front of no fans due to civil unrest, and August 11th marked the first time in MLB history where all 15 home teams won on the same day. Now, with that out of the way, let's meet our teams. Normally, 
We start off by giving the history of our teams, but since we already did that in our 1980 World Series video, go check that one out, we'll skip over it for now. Filling in the blanks where we left off from there, the Royals took home a title in 1985 thanks in large part to a controversial outcall over the Cardinals in the I-70 series, and then proceeded to go 29 seasons before deciding to make the playoffs again in 2014. In last season's World Series, they took a dynastic San Francisco Giants team all the way to a Game 7, only to be defeated by the almighty Thanos and his legendary 52 and two-thirds innings pitched that postseason. They should have sent Gordon, just saying. In 2015, the Royals were back, doing what they do best, royal balling with small ball and low-budget players. If you want more explanation on this, of course, head over to Foolish Baseball and check out the excellent royal ball video he did over there. Led by former taxidermist, this is real, Ned Yost and the core of Alex Gordon, Eric Hosmer, Lorenzo Cain, Alcides Escobar, and Salvador Perez, the Royals cruised through a relatively weak AL Central and back into the playoffs. The Royals were tasked with dealing with the wildcard up-and-coming Astros, who punched them right in the mouth to begin the series in a tight victory at Kauffman Stadium before the series went to a decisive Game 5 back in KC. KC finally had enough with the Astros' foolishness, as they decided to blow them out to the tune of a 7-2 victory. In the ALCS, the Royals were tasked with facing the Toronto Blue Jays, fresh off a series win thanks to Elvis Andres for getting how to field, and Jose Bautista hitting one of the greatest home runs in baseball history, which surely won't spark anything later. KC controlled pretty much the entire series, as they took care of business in six games, winning their fourth pennant and second in a row. Moving on over to Flushing, the New York Amazing Metropolitans, or just the Mets, were originally founded in 1962 as one of baseball's first expansion teams, bringing a second team back to New York as the Dodgers and Giants both left for California. Like most expansion teams in any sport, unless you're the Vegas Golden Knights, they did terrible to start, going 40 and 120 in their inaugural season. According to the Wikipedia article, the Mets never finished better than second to last until 1969 when they pulled the Uno reverse card and won the World Series with 100 wins over the 109 win Orioles in an upset, garnering the Miracle Mets nickname. The Mets won again in 1986, fueled by copious amounts of, that's right, cocaine, and now with a fourth pennant under their belt by 2000, the Mets look to challenge their crosstown rivals in the Subway Series for a shot at glory. Yeah, that went absolutely nowhere. Their next best shot came in 2006 until they lost to arguably the greatest curveball of all time, shaking them so badly they did not make the playoffs again until 2015. Again, would highly recommend this video by the Finns Chats for further explanation. The 2015 Mets came into the season hoping to bring the first winning season to this side of New York since the opening of City Field in 2009. The Mets were optimistic as they had a new core full of exciting young pitchers, and an old pitcher who gets everyone excited. We're talking about Jacob deGrom, Thor himself, Noah Syndergaard, Steven Matz, who we discussed earlier, the Dark Knight, Matt Harvey, and the substantial seductive himself, Bartolo friggin' Cologne. The rest of the lineup rounded out very well with veterans Curtis Granderson and David Wright, and then younger bloods in Daniel Murphy, Travis Darno, and Wilmer Flores. And yes, this was the year with the whole Wilmer Flores trade debacle. The Mets had a hot start, followed by a terrible summer, only being bolstered by the acquisition of Ioannis Cespedes at the trade deadline to cap off a hot second half of the season. In the end, the Mets won the NL East, going 90-72 over a fairly weak division, and setting themselves up for a date with the Dodgers. The Mets were almost bested in the NLDS, as the LA pitching duo of Clayton Kershaw and Zach Greinke were almost too much to overcome. The Mets ended up winning in five, despite a blatant assault attempt by Chase Utley in Game 2, earning the right to play the up-and-coming Cubs for the NL pennant. And while these Cubs were good, they were a little inexperienced and unprepared for Mets pitching, as Matt Harvey outdueled John Lester, Noah Syndergaard beat Cy Young winner Jake Arrieta, DeGrom cooked Kyle Hendricks, and Big Sexy himself cruised against Jason Hamill. With a sweep in hand, the Mets took their fifth pennant and rode off to face the Royals in Kansas City three days later. And we've made it. Welcome to Game 1. 
It is October 27th at 7.09 p.m. Central Standard Time, Kauffman Stadium, Kansas City, Missouri. Matt Harvey is taking the hill for the Mets and... And he swings and hits it into left center. Back at the track, it is dropped. Cespedes couldn't make the catch. How about that effort? Digging around third. Here comes Escobar. one nothing Kansas City. And wow. one nothing Royals already as Alcides Escobar takes Matt Harvey deep? Maybe deep into that deep Royals outfield is a better expression. Funnily enough, this electric opening had actually happened once before in a World Series, as Patsy Doherty did the same thing to open Game 2 of the 1903 World Series. Edinson Volquez would take the hill for the Royals on the day that his dad unfortunately passed away. As there's a drive in a deep left field by Castellanos, it will be a home run. And so that'll make it a 4-0 ball game. Volquez was unaware until after the game's conclusion. The Mets would strike back after getting punched in the mouth by plating a run in the fourth and Curtis Granderson homering in another in the fifth. Now, if you were watching this on TV, you may have been confused as to why a Fox scoreboard appeared with the Mets' first run, but now an MLB Network scoreboard appeared during their next run. This was due to a bizarre power outage at the Fox broadcasting compound in the fourth inning and throwing the broadcast into a frenzy for a good portion of the game. The game itself was delayed for seven minutes due to there being no working cameras for replay, but both Terry Collins and Ned Yost agreed they would just continue the game without replay. Fox was able to get most of their primary feedback for the sixth inning, and no further issues were had. In the top of the sixth, the Mets would tack on another run, making it 3-1 off a sacrifice fly. On the next play, Wilmer Flores would send one screaming down the third baseline, only to be picked by Moustakis at third, saving the run. In the royal half of the inning, Hosmer would sacrifice in a run while Moustakis singled in another to knot the game at three. In the eighth, a Hosmer fielding error gifted the Mets another run, allowing for the Mets to bring in their star closer, Juris Familia, in for the save and for the game. Familia needed four outs. He got two, and then Alex Gordon absolutely cooked him for a home run to dead center, tying the game. This was Familia's first blown save since July 30th. The game moved to extras where the Royals' bullpen kept things in check through the 11th. In the bottom of the 11th, Gerard Dyson led off with a line shot into left field, only to be robbed by Curtis Granderson of what surely would have been a leadoff triple. Dyson came up again in the next inning with the bases loaded and two outs, only to pop out thanks to not being able to handle the sheer sex appeal that is Bartolo Colon, who was on the mound for this inning. Both teams stayed silent until the 14th, where in the Royals' half, Escobar hit a ground ball to third that was bobbled by David Wright, allowing him to reach safely. Ben Zobrist would single him over, and, with the bases loaded and nobody out, Hosmer would sack in Escobar, giving the Royals a 1-0 lead in the series. With this loss, Bartolo Colon became the oldest player in MLB history to be credited with a loss in the World Series. Game two began at, say it with me now, the same place, same time, one day later. Johnny Cueto took the hill against Jacob deGrom in what was sure to be a pitcher's duel for the ages. Except that Cueto absolutely cooked New York seemingly out of nowhere to the tune of a two-hit, one-run complete game performance. The Royals were shut down for the first four innings by deGrom, only for him to then give up four runs in the fifth inning, and then get yanked out of the game. You know, this start is a lot like deGrom's entire career. The first little bit has the potential to be one of the greatest ever, and then, when he hits the rotation for a second or third time, his elbow inexplicably turns to dust and he either needs another Tommy John, or he gives up four runs in a World Series game. This dude is seriously one of the great what-if pitchers of our time. Anyway, the Royals would then pounce for another three runs in the eighth, and then Cueto would close the game by becoming the first AL pitcher since Jack Morris in 1991 to throw a complete game in the World Series. He also was the first pitcher since Jim Lonberg of the 1967 Red Sox to throw a World Series complete game with two hits or fewer. As of the recording of this video, this was the last complete game thrown in the World Series, and with the way elbows are going these days, there's a good chance this will stand for a good long while.
Moving on over to Queens for Game 3, the Mets called on the God of Thunder to face Jordano Ventura, RIP, in a must-win game. After Billy Joel finished off the national anthem, the Royals would take advantage of the Mets' defense to get a run off of a forced play and go up 1-0. Not to worry, as New York picked right up with a Captain America two-run home run in the bottom half of the inning to energize the New York crowd. Kansas City would punch back the next inning with Salvador Perez singling in a run and then getting another run off of a passed ball to make it 3-2. New York was not backing down, as in the bottom of the third after a Syndergaard single, shoutouts to the old National League, Curtis Granderson went deep again to put the Mets up 4-3. They would control the rest of this game from here on out as they took advantage of some uncharacteristic defensive mistakes by the Royals in the 4th and the 6th, giving us a final score of 9-3 and giving New York a much needed win. Oh yeah, we should also probably mention that in the fifth inning, one Adalberto Mondesi came into the game for the Royals to pinch hit for Danny Duffy, making him the first MLB player ever to debut in the World Series. Man, even when they're losing the game, the Royals are still making history. Country music star Tim McGraw threw out the first pitch for New York the next night, as we once again come full circle on how did we get here. Chris Young and Steven Matz would face each other this game as both settled in the first two and a half, putting up respectable zeros. In the bottom of the third, Michael Conforto homered for first blood, followed by a Granderson sack fly a few batters later to make the game 2-0. This second run could have definitely been avoided if not for KC left fielder Alex Rios actually forgetting how many outs there were after catching the ball, allowing the runner to tag in plenty of time. Salvador Perez would put up a run for KC in the top of the fifth, only for Conforto to come right back and blast yet another home run in the bottom half of the inning, making him the first rookie to hit two home runs in a World Series game since Andrew Jones in 1996. Ben Zobrist would also hit his eighth double of the postseason, tying Albert Pujols and David Fries' numbers from the 2011 postseason. Lorenzo Cain then drove in Zobrist, bringing the score to 3-2. In the 8th, Tyler Clippert of the Mets would walk two in a row to force Collins to go to Familia. Thanks in large part to an uncharacteristic fielding error by Daniel Murphy at 2nd, Ustakas would tie the game and then Perez would bring in another run, bringing the score to 5-3. Familia had blown yet another postseason save opportunity, however, a lot of this one could be attributed to Murphy's costly fielding error. Wade Davis pitched a perfect 8th for the Royals before getting into a somewhat sticky ninth. A Moustakis miscue allowed for a base runner, followed by a Cespedes hit to bring the winning run and Lucas Duda to the plate. In true Mets fashion, the game ended when Duda lined to Moustakis at third, and then Moustakis doubled off Cespedes at first, who was running, thinking the ball would hit the ground. In terms of abrupt endings to World Series games, I'd say this is right up there with Game 4 of the 2013 World Series, which ended with Colton Wong getting picked off at first. And no, I'm still not over it. The Royals were now up 3-1 in this series with a 5-3 victory, looking to go for the kill shot the next night. It is now November as the Mets are officially in do-or-die mode for Game 5. The Dark Knight would need to call on all of his strength for this game to will New York to a win. Curtis Grand would pick him up immediately for a home run in the bottom of the first, and then would score the Mets' only other run in the sixth after the Mets could only manage getting a single run out of a bases-loaded, no-out situation. Matt Harvey was phenomenal in eight innings as Casey had zero answers for him. If only baseball games were eight innings and not nine, as this may have gone down as one of the most electric World Series pitching performances ever, with Harvey willing his team toward a victory with every inning pitched. Terry Collins was faced with the decision heading into the ninth. Do you listen to the fans and let Harvey back out there despite his high pitch count? Or do you bring in Familia, who, while a fresh arm, could be a liability to you? After some arguing by Harvey, Collins pulled what we like to call a reverse pulling Blake Snell in the fifth inning of a game he could have won, and let Harvey back into the mound for the ninth. Sunlight came for the Dark Knight, however, as he would walk Lorenzo Cain to start the inning, and then allow Hosmer to drive him in. Harvey was yanked for Familia, where Familia would proceed to blow his third save in eight opportunities this postseason, tying him with Rob Nen in 2002 for the most. As Perez hit one softly to David Wright at third, Wright checked Hosmer before throwing to first, 
and in a daring play, Hosmer broke for the plate as the ball headed for first, and Duda was not ready for it, throwing the ball away way wide and allowing Hosmer to score. Hosmer's almost reckless base running tied the game and sent it to extras. The game moved to the 12th where, unfortunately, the Mets' bullpen and defense gave up on them as the Royals would score five in the top half of the inning before Wade Davis slammed the door in the bottom half, giving KC its first title in 30 years. Salvador Perez was given the MVP after batting a respectable 364 and catching every inning of the series but the final one. He became the first catcher since Pat Borders in 1992 to win World Series MVP and the second Venezuelan behind Pablo Sandoval. Paulo Orlando also made history as the first Brazilian to win the World Series and the third South American to do so at the time. The ratings for this series were surprisingly high for every game except for Game 5, but even then, Game 5 was the most watched Game 5 since 2003. With the Mets losing the series, it would mark the first decade since 1910 in which no New York team won the World Series, with the Yankees not even appearing during the 2010s. The Royals have not made the playoffs since, going 81-81 in 2016, while the Mets have lull Mets their way in and out of small playoff appearances for the better part of the last decade now. I believe the lasting legacy of this series to be a hidden gem. As we said at the beginning of the video, you often overlook it when seeing the two series that sandwich this one, but this series offered just the same amount of entertainment for far lower stakes. The KC Redemption arc was complete, finally giving a title to one of the most underrated yet awesome teams in MLB history. And for the Mets, one could argue that this was the start of the modern iteration of Lowell Mets, and Mets fans in the comments, let us know if you agree with that take. I don't know if a lot of people saw this World Series coming at the start of the season, but it was memorable and it deserves more praise. And even though we on this channel are Cardinals fans, to our sister team across the state, this one goes out to you. <laughs> <laughs>